Hello and welcome to Just Have a Think. Last Monday, the 8th of October 2018, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, or IPCC, released a special report outlining the extent to which our planet has warmed as a result of human activity over the last 100 years or so, and the risks posed by further human-induced warming over the coming decades. Essentially, there's three versions of the report they released. There's this four-page press release designed to fill a one-minute slot on a television news programme or about half a column in a newspaper. Then there's the more comprehensive summary for policymakers, which at 34 pages contains more detail about the report findings, backed by some graphical representations showing projections for the future and reasons for concern. And it's this version that journalists and news programmes use to present the findings of the report in a bit more detail. And by the way, real credit has to go to the Guardian newspaper here for standing head and shoulders above any other mainstream publication for their consistent and dogged pursuit of this crucial agenda. Then there's the actual report, which is not this. This is, in fact, just a list of all the references they had to look at to compile the actual report. In fact, it's worth pointing out here that although the IPC is populated predominantly by eminent scientists in the various fields of climatology, they don't actually conduct their own scientific research. What they do is review and assess the truly massive amount of scientific data being produced all around the globe to arrive at as comprehensive a set of numbers as possible. And that's why they're called a panel and not a laboratory. Anyway, all that assessing and reviewing results in this which is the real report. It's about a thousand pages. Here's the first headline from the press release. Limiting global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius would require rapid, far-reaching and unprecedented changes in all aspects of society. And it goes on to say, we're already seeing the consequences of one degree Celsius of global warming through more extreme weather, rising sea levels and diminishing Arctic sea ice, among other changes. And limiting warming to 1.5 degrees C is possible within the laws of chemistry and physics, but doing so would require unprecedented changes. All right, so that all sounds pretty disturbing right off the bat, but let's take a look at the key points from the 34 page summary for policymakers to see how they come to some of those conclusions. Now, as is often the case, they start out with a nice big complicated graph. So let's get our holographic contraption back on so we can build the graph up and look at each bit and there we go so the vertical axis is showing the temperatures in degrees celsius above the average temperature between 1850 and 1900 and then the horizontal axis shows the years from 1960 up to 2100 obviously we've already got actual temperature data for 1960 to 2017 which looks like this it's what the scientists call a noisy signal with lots of uh, seasonal variation. But what they were able to do was draw this trend line through the plots showing the extent that humans have been responsible for these increasing temperatures. And that's what they call the anthropogenic warming. And they also ascribe a range of variability using this light orange plume. So then they project forward to show how they conclude that limiting temperatures to 1.5 degrees Celsius increase is still possible. This grey plume represents a projected temperature range in a scenario where global CO2 emissions reach net zero in 2055, while non-CO2 radiative forcing, by which they mean things like methane and nitrous oxide, both predominantly products of massive global livestock farming, is reduced after 2030. We'll have a think about that statement in a moment, but before we do that, there's a couple of more elements to this graph that we need to overlay. Firstly, this green plume shows the even more optimistic limitation to temperature rises based on reaching net zero carbon emissions by 2040 rather than 2055. And finally, they overlay a third plume in purple to represent no reduction of net non-CO2 radiative forcing. In other words, no reduction in the global stripping of forestry land to make way for cattle for human consumption. And that actually shows an upper level of two degrees Celsius by 2100. 
And bearing in mind that, that the title of the entire report is Global Warming of 1.5 Degrees Celsius, clearly the IPCC aims to demonstrate how much worse off we'll be at 2 degrees of warming than we'd be at 1.5 degrees of warming. And to help us understand that, the summary for policymakers contains a couple more visual aids showing what they refer to as reasons for concern. Back in programme 17, when we looked at Arctic sea ice loss, I showed a similar chart of RFCs from the last IPCC report released back in 2013. These new charts are updated versions of that based on the latest data. So here comes the first one. Starting with the colour code, very similar to the 2013 charts, with white at the bottom meaning undetectable, moving up through the yellow phase, which they call moderate risk, and then up through the, the red phase, which is high risk, and then up into the purple zone, which is very high risk. We've got a temperature axis up this side, ranging from zero degrees higher than 1850 to 1900 levels, all the way up to and beyond two degrees higher than 1850 to 1900 levels. This gray horizontal section shows how the global temperature has risen between 2006 and 2015. And then they plot five columns representing their five main reasons for concern. RFC1 is called unique and threatened systems, by which they mean things like coral reefs, the Arctic and its indigenous peoples, mountain glaciers, and biodiversity hotspots. Even at 1.5 degrees warming, these things are getting absolutely battered, but at two degrees, they're well into the very high risk territory, which the IPCC defined as being a severe risk of irreversibility and an inability to adapt due to the nature of the hazard. Then comes extreme weather events, which we've all already seen all over the world and which move into high risk as we approach 1.5 degrees Celsius. That one's followed by something called distribution of impacts. That means the disproportionate impacts of certain areas of the globe due to the uneven distribution of the effects of global warming, already clearly happening and set to get worse and worse. Then we get global aggregate impacts, which is things like economic impacts and cumulative degradation of ecosystems and biodiversity over time. And lastly, large scale singular events like loss of ice sheets, for example. But in this 2018 report, the IPCC break those categories down even further into these 10 columns to show some of the really catastrophic impacts on very specific systems. So you can quite clearly see that already at 1.5 degrees of warming, the warm water coral reefs are in big trouble. In fact, the IPCC state that at this temperature, 70 to 90% of all these reefs will be lost. And at two degrees Celsius of warming, that figure goes up to 99%. The Arctic region with its amplified warming is already at high risk, and this is getting much worse very quickly. Coastal flooding is obviously only going to get worse as sea levels rise, as is fluvial flooding, which is rivers bursting their banks due to torrential rain events. So it's pretty clear that limiting temperatures to 1.5 degrees Celsius instead of 2 degrees Celsius would make a very significant difference to levels of impact we see around the globe. And what sort of global reduction in carbon emissions would we need to see in order to achieve this 1.5 degree Celsius aspiration? Well, thankfully, the summary report provides us with yet another graph to clarify that situation. And here it is. With net global CO2 emissions measured in billions of tonnes or gigatons up the left hand side and the years once again from 1960 to 2100 along the bottom. This line shows how the actual CO2 emissions have risen up to today caused mainly by human beings burn fossil, burning fossil fuels to power our transport, our industry and our energy needs. And here's what the line needs to do if we're to stay below 1.5 degrees of warming. Now, as you know, I'm not a scientist, but I have looked at a lot of graphs in my 49 years, and I've never seen one in the real world that does anything like that. In fact, it's 30 years this year since Dr. James Hansen testified before the United States Congress that climate change was already a clear and present danger. And yet since that date back in 1988, human beings have emitted more carbon dioxide into the atmosphere than the entire cumulative total emitted between 1750 and 1988. 
This graphic from the online site Carbon Brief shows how much of our fossil fuels we'd need to leave in the ground to have any chance of even staying below 2 degrees Celsius, let alone 1.5 degrees. 88% of global coal reserves would have to stay untouched, with the United States letting go of 95% of its reserves. Now I think you know as well as I do that our good friends in the fossil fuel industry are unlikely to suddenly find religion and choose to make the historically altruistic gesture of shutting down all their operations with immediate effect to safeguard the futures of our children and grandchildren. Not when there's money still in the ground and a quarterly earnings report to beat. It's just not the way they're built. They haven't spent hundreds of millions of dollars buying false advertising and handsomely rewarding misguided muppets like this lot to make documentaries based on lies and misleading data just to throw in the towel and raise the white flag now. No, no. Quite the opposite, in fact. There's about 2,800 billion tonnes of CO2 emissions still available from accessible fossil fuels, all of which the fossil fuel producers fully intend to keep burning for as long as they can. And yet the CO2 budget to keep us below 2 degrees Celsius is only 565 billion more tonnes. If we let these people have their way and we stay on that business as usual trajectory, which the IPCC call Representative Concentration Pathway 8.5, then the global temperature increase over the 21st century looks like this. And it's no exaggeration to say that that really would severely jeopardise our ability to survive as a species on this planet. Now, just to be clear, I'm 100% in support of every single effort to fight and stop these huge global polluters and I believe it's crucial that we keep pushing that agenda as hard as we possibly can collectively. But the reality is that the IPCC aspiration of remaining below 1.5 degrees, although technically possible within the laws of chemistry and physics, as they state in their press release, is extremely unlikely to be achieved. So why didn't the IPCC provide us with more realistic scenarios? Well, it turns out the scientists did provide them. It's just the politicians and the international lawyers wouldn't let the scientists include them in the press release or the summary document. But dig into the main body of this biblical production and amongst countless other mind-boggling details, you find buried right in the middle three predictive scenarios for how the 21st century will play out based on different levels of social and political response to the CO2 emissions reduction policies. And if you look closely at the bottom of this page, I can just show you there, you see there's an interesting statement. Do not cite, quote, or distribute. Well, I am going to cite and quote all three of these scenarios so you can judge for yourself. Transport is strongly decarbonised through a shift to electric vehicles. Several industry-sized plants for carbon capture and storage are installed and tested in the 2020s. Agriculture is intensified in countries with coordinated planning associated with a drastic decrease in food wastage. Adaptive measures such as the establishment of corridors for the movement of species and parts of ecosystems become a central practice within conservation management. Crops are grown on marginal land and no-till agriculture is deployed and large areas are reforested with native trees. Societal preference for healthy diets reduces meat consumption and associated greenhouse gas emissions. By 2100, global mean temperature is on average 0.5 degrees Celsius warmer than it was in 2018. In mid-latitudes, there are frequent hot summers and precipitation events tend to be more intense. Coastal communities struggle with increased inundation associated with rising sea levels and more frequent and intense rainfall. Glaciers extent decreases in most mountainous areas. Small island developing states, coastal and low-lying areas have faced significant changes but have largely persisted in most regions. The Mediterranean area becomes drier and irrigation of crops expands, drawing the water table down in many areas. The Amazon is reasonably well preserved through avoided risk of possible large changes in regional temperature average as well as through reduced deforestation. While some climate hazards become more frequent, timely adaptation measures help reduce the associated risks for most, although poor and disadvantaged groups continue to experience high climate risks to their livelihoods and well-being. Summer sea ice has not completely disappeared from the Arctic. The Earth's system, while warmer, is still recognisable compared to the 2000s. Crop yields remain relatively stable. Aggregate economic damage of climate change impacts is relatively small. 
human well-being remains overall similar to that in 2020. So that's a scenario where fossil fuel use drops off a cliff starting tomorrow and we all skip happily off into the sunset. Now let's have a look at the IPC's mid-case scenario. The international community continues to largely support the Paris Agreement and agrees in 2020 on reduction targets for CO2 emissions and timeframes for net zero emissions. However, these targets are not ambitious enough to reach stabilisation at 2 degrees Celsius warming, let alone 1.5 degrees Celsius. Temperatures are regularly above 1.5 degrees Celsius warming. Deadly heat waves in major cities, droughts in southern Europe, South Africa and the Western Sahel and major flooding in Asia all lead to increasing levels of public unrest and political destabilisation. An emergency global summit in 2025 moves to much more ambitious climate targets. Disruptive technologies become crucial to face up to the adaptation measures needed. Temperature peaks at 2 degrees Celsius by the middle of the century. Reaching 2 degrees Celsius for several decades eliminates or severely damages key ecosystems such as coral reefs and tropical forests. The elimination of coral reef ecosystems, as well as serious losses of coastal ecosystems such as mangrove forests and seagrass beds, leads to much reduced levels of coastal defence. The intensive area required for the production of bioenergy combined with increasing water stress sets pressures on food prices. Crop yields decline significantly in the tropics. Natural ecosystems decrease in abundance due to climate change as well as of land use change. Many natural ecosystems, in particular in the Mediterranean, are lost due to the combined effects of climate change and land use change. Several of the remaining natural ecosystems experience irreversible climate change related damages. Migration force displacement and loss of identity are extensive in some countries. The health and well-being of people generally decreases from 2020, while the levels of poverty and disadvantage increase very significantly. And then there's scenario three, which is the one we're really at risk of following if we don't change radically and quickly. CO2 emissions are reduced at local and national level, but efforts are limited and not always successful. Radiative forcing increases and due to chance the most extreme events tend to happen in less populated regions, thus not increasing global concerns. 1.5 degrees Celsius warming is reached by 2030. Several catastrophic years occur while global temperature warming starts to approach 2 degrees Celsius. There are major heat waves on all continents. Droughts occur in regions bordering the Mediterranean Sea, Central North America, the Amazon region and Southern Australia. Intense flooding occurs in high latitude and tropical regions. Major ecosystems are destroyed over that period with massive disruption to local livelihoods. An unprecedented drought leads to large impacts on the Amazon rainforest, which is also affected by deforestation. A two-year drought in the Great Plains and a concomitant drought in Eastern Europe and Russia decrease global food production, resulting in major increases in food prices and eroding food security. Poverty levels increase to a very large scale. Human health suffers. There are high levels of public unrest and political destabilisation due to the increasing climatic pressures. Massive investments in renewable energy often happen too late and are uncoordinated. Some countries propose to consider sulphate aerosol based solar radiation modification. Global and regional temperatures continue to strongly increase while mitigation solutions are being developed and implemented. Global mean warming reaches 3 degrees Celsius by 2100. The world as it was in 2020 is no longer recognisable, with decreasing life expectancy, reduced outdoor labour productivity and lower quality of life in many regions because of too frequent heat waves and other climate extremes. Major conflicts take place. Almost all ecosystems experience irreversible impacts. Species extinction rates are high in all regions, forest fires escalate and biodiversity strongly decreases. Life for many indigenous and rural groups becomes untenable in their ancestral lands. Several small island states give up hope to survive in their place and look to an increasingly fragmented global community for refuge. Aggregate economic damages are substantial owing to the combined effects of climate changes, political instability and losses of ecosystem services. The general health and well-being of people is substantially decreased compared to the conditions in 2020 and continues to worsen over the following decades. So what happens now? What do you and I do? What do our governments do? You change your behaviours is what you do. 
Every minute you're sitting there watching this and reassuring yourself that it's the government's job to sort all this out is another minute when you are not taking responsibility for your behaviours. You need to do that first. And then when you've done that, you need to change the behaviours of your family and your friends. And once all that's done, we all need to change the behaviours of our governments. In the final two chapters of the report, the IPCC outlines many systems, policies and actions that the global community can take to mitigate the worst effects of the current climate change rates. I'll be taking a very close look at those and other proposals from around the world in next week's programme. That's it for now though. Thanks very much for watching. We're a fairly new channel here at Just Have a Think and our goal is to understand and respond to the world's climate and energy challenges in four key ways. By providing insight, by relating each issue to collective action, by promoting behavioural change and by highlighting solutions that are accessible to and achievable by most people. So if that's a format that you think is useful, please do subscribe so that we can grow the channel and get information out to as many people as possible. And you can do that by clicking this link here. As always, have a great week and remember to just have a think. See you in part two.